Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. Mr. O'Brien, let's do Unit 3's review. Florida Wildlife Unit 3. Okay. First coming up is the Felis concolor cori, the Florida panther, an endangered species. <clears throat> Felis, coming from the word, which is the cat phylum, the cat family. Concolor, a cat of one color, usually taupe. The old Florida crackers said that panthers came in two colors. They were blue and they were reds. If they were gray, they were considered to be blue. And if they were red, they had that high kind of a red taupe color. Uh, the Florida panther is unique because he is a animal who has adapted to the pine lands very well. He has a very, very deep chest, but a shallow rib cage. It's almost like he's built deeper and not wider, so he can travel through the pine forest at night, very stealth-like. Interesting thing about this cat, besides having uh, not elliptical eyes like a human being and having oval eyes, he has tremendous peripheral vision. His body can weigh anywhere from 100 pounds to about 160 for a really healthy adult. The tail is one-third the length of the body. And this predator used to be so numerous in Florida that back as early as, well, 1945, if you killed a Florida panther, the game warden would reward you with $5 because they were a big threat to the cattle industry here in Florida. Let's go to the next slide. All right. Now, panthers, okay, <clears throat> They prefer white-tailed deer. They have been known, even times of drought, to eat grasshoppers. And look at this unique picture. I'm not sure what happened to this poor guy's tail, but he's gone fishing, and that's a shark. Now, panthers are kind of like omnivores. They'll practically eat anything, but the Florida white-tailed deer is considered to be their specialty. Yes, they've even tackled alligators. Now, men, the, unfortunately, the Florida panther needs about 50,000 acres of range. Because he's a rogue and likes to travel by himself, <coughs> excuse me, right, <coughs> he travels by himself, unfortunately, because there's so few of these cats left in South Florida and West Florida, that there's a lot of inbreeding. Inbreeding is when... Uh, sisters and brothers, mothers and sons, that sort of thing. And it has caused some real genetic difficulties. Some of those genetic difficulties include <clears throat> a sexual hernia, which is when the testicle does not drop into the scrotum, low sperm count, uh, sperm that is misformed. We have also seen cats born without an upper molar, a kink in the tail, cowlicks between the hair, right? And so they tried, they tried desperately 20, 25 years ago to introduce Florida cougars to save the genetic strain. But the cougars, as we told you in lecture, they, a lot of them just literally tried to march back to Texas. So there was some success, but still inbreeding is a huge issue for Felis concolor cori. Remember, these cats are protected by the National Federal Endangered Species Act. All right. Now, the big problem to these guys, men, is still automobiles. The state of Florida has done a great job in I-75 building special bridges that the cats can go underneath so they no longer have to travel on top of I-75. There are cameras in these special made bridges, new fences. But men, unfortunately, I-75 in parts of West Florida, the Fatahatchee Swamp, the big corkscrew swamp, we're still getting a lot of panther death. And, you know, on average, we can lose anywhere between 8 to 14 panthers a year. And most of that is not by poaching, but that's by automobiles, high rate of speed. Very unfortunate. Now, in this particular animal, man, uh, they think that there's only between 30 and 50 left. My sources say there's about 24. And the problem is that there are more males than females. 
Now, on average, this cat only has one to four kittens, and the survival rate is not great. And they like to, uh, they only come together to mate, and then they are, they're rogues. Like we said, they travel by themselves. They prefer the pine forest, and a cat, a good cat, can live between 10 to 12 years. Now, take a close look at this one, right? Look at the size of the paw. That is the ace in the hole. That is a killing weapon when he is hunting. The sheer impact of that paw will drop any animal, whether it's a wild pig, uh, a deer, and in some cases, even turkeys. That's a great website, by the way. You can get a chance to check it out. Okay, We saw the video of the, uh, the teenagers on bicycles that ran across this young cat. Look here. You can still see the dots. Uh, meaning that he's probably less than two years old. They lose those dots. They lose those dots as soon as they become older. There's an adolescent. All the kittens are born with blue eyes. If you want to take a look at this map closer, this is the, the range of where we find bears. I threw that in there just for a measurement. And we find panthers. Unfortunately, this is an older slide. And we can see the areas where they have the primary contact with human beings and unfortunately we also have on this chart the number of cats that were killed in 2012 slowly look at this slowly they have been migrating but this migration is not usual this type of migration is very very shall we say not normal uh here's old uno uno was hit by a shotgun blast and now lives in the naples zoo Remember, men, that the Endangered Species Act of 1973, and this will definitely be a test question, can be punishable by one year in federal prison, a fine up to $100,000. Now, you don't have to kill a protected animal. You can, what they say, molest it. Molest it is when you do anything to, shall we say, incur harm or discomfort to the animal in his environment or in his habitat or in his just daily hunting patterns. So, uh, don't say to the judge that you're being attacked by a panther, because in, in the long history of Florida, we don't have a single, not one single report of a panther fatality on a human being. Now, the old crackers who lived in South Florida back in the 1800s, 1890s, said that panthers would steal children out of their baby cribs inside the house. But that is folklore, and because we have no evidence, we still don't believe these cats are aggressive like California cougars. All right, we got to see that great movie. That was a great movie. Oh, the, the West Indian manatee, Trachus manateus, right? Remember we said the manatee is actually uh, a little bit less in weight than the rest of the manatees of the Caribbean? <clears throat> Excuse me, he weighs about 800 pounds, is... Friends to the south, closer to uh, Cuba and, you know, the Central America and South America weigh close to 1,200 pounds. And remember, he is a male, and they are, unlike the panther, they're not rogues. They do like to travel in pods, but they have a problem, and that problem is their reproduction cycle. The reproduction cycle is, is that a cow can be pregnant for up to a year. We also talked about the fact that it takes them about four or five years to mature sexually and if they lose a calf sometimes the cows will not come into gestation or come into season again for a year or two because they have such a low birth rate this is what really makes them endangered now we know we know they're mammals they're very efficient breathers they can hold their breath for five minutes but remember they do have a brain about the size of a gigantic walnut and they are complete herbivores. They spend most of their day eating nothing but vegetation, such as seagrass and uh, turtle grass and things we find here. Remember, they are also protected by the Endangered Species Act, even though they're threatened now. We also talked about the fact that they are <clears throat> mammals. They do do everything that we do. And when they have young, they breastfeed. And those uh, breasts appear in the armpit of the mother and as you can see here there's a young calf feeding with the mother and remember kind of interesting 
uh, the West Indian manatee is very closely related to the elephant. I don't know which came first. Now, he has no blinding speed. He does have a tremendous number of teeth that replace each other as he grinds these things. You know, he just grinds them and they fall out and a new set shows up. And he has very, very good hearing. Excellent hearing. He has no natural enemies. That's a good test question. But he becomes victim of not only boats, cold weather, and sometimes he actually gets crushed between in seaports between ships and the steel-plated harbor. So he's not a big fan of the red tide either, as we discussed, okay? So <clears throat> floodgate canals. They get crushed, right? They're very, very affected by cold weather snaps, and red algae has been known to kill these gentle sea cows of the Atlantic. Yeah, you know, we talked about the fact that they could uh, live in both fresh water, brackish water, salt water, okay? And uh, we talked about the range and the zone here, but please remember that even though there's algae growing on this particular animal, his nose moves all the time, or else the algae would grow on his snout, and he would literally not be able to see. So nature has taken care of that, but these slow-moving animals, who can do spurts of 15 miles an hour, all right, algae, yep. We also talked about how inadvertently atomic power plants and electrical plants with hot water conduits coming out are always a great place because the manatees like to use this water kind of like a hot tub. And in the winter, they'll start migrating down to South Florida because they just don't like cold weather. And we talked about the fact that they're found in fresh water, salt water, brackish water, and it can be found all the way up to, in some cases, even the Carolinas. All these stars represent areas where manatees have gathered and have prospered. Then we talked about the black bear. We had a nice video about that. And we were talking about the fact that a black bear is not slow. <clears throat> a black bear can run up to 30 miles an hour. And the worst thing you can do with a black bear, and even though they've lost up to 84% of their environment, their habitat in 2020, the bear population is on the increase. That would be a nice true and false question on the test. And the worst thing you can do to a bear is to encourage it by feeding it. If you have bird seed, you're going to get visited. If you have garbage cans that are not secured, you're going to get visited. Right? If you have food in the back of the vehicle, even though the windows are locked and shut, you're going to get visited. Bird feeders, outdoor cat and dog food, garbage cans. And if you get a chance, you can read through these slides. But remember that we said that the bear population is on the increase. And the best thing you can do is, if you see a bear, is to avoid it or make a lot of noise so he's aware that you are there. But for God's sake, don't ever, ever, ever encourage a bear by trying to feed it. All right? Some of these bears, men, can get up to 300, 350 pounds. There's even a couple of monsters back in the 70s that weighed over 700 pounds. <clears throat> this particular guy up here has got a little bit of mange. And he's not doing very well, but this bear has found himself a good habitat. And now they're becoming even braver because of more people moving to Florida, more property, more garbage cans as the pinewood forests begin to disappear. Uh, they're kind of like a dust to dawn feeders, right? But uh, don't leave your dirty barbecue out because if they smell hamburgers, right? They'd rather have a hamburger or grease over fruits and berries anytime, anytime, all right? And we're talking about that very problem of not having garbage, bare garbage-proof cans, which are now becoming an item in the state of Florida. All right, this is the Everglades snail kite, one of the rare birds that can hover backwards. He's living exclusively on something called the snail kite or apple kite snails. And he is endangered because his habitat is disappearing. And he's also discovering that the 
apple snails are decreasing in population. And this might be because of mercury poisoning that's happening in the Everglades because of the burnoff of the sugarcane fields and also because of industry and pollution. Here's the wood stork, the iron-headed wood stork, called the barometer of the Everglades. Remember, all the park rangers look at his nest first, or her nest. If the nests are up, they're going to have a great year. If the nests are down, they're in trouble. If the water's too salty, no mating. Too noisy, no mating. Not enough food, no mating. Anything that is not perfect with the environment, weather, Salinity, high tides, low tides, flooding, drought, noise, this bird will not mate. So you can go out into the Everglades and look at the number of nests of the iron-headed stork and know immediately if it's going to be a good year or a bad year. Gator holes. Mama Gator <clears throat> does a great service to the Everglades when she digs a hole to lay her eggs. And after she lays two or three dozen eggs, sometimes even more, she covers up these holes that she has dug with her tail and her paws, covers it in straw. The temperature of the nest determines the sex of the alligator hatching. Yes, the warmer the nest, the more likely the alligator will be male. And then when the babies start hatching and crawling out, she digs the nest out and escorts them to the closest water, watery habitat. But men, when the dry season comes between November and April, this fills up and becomes the watering hole for almost every type of life in the Everglades, from the smallest crustacean to the largest predator, will all come here. We also talked about the fact that birds like to drink here. Often they avoid fruit and seeds, that they cannot digest, and we start seeing hardwood hammocks grow around the gator hole. This is the gator hole here that's already covered with the eggs inside. We also talked about the fact that the little gopher turtles like to sneak in there and lay their eggs, and then mama turtle takes off because her eggs hatch first, and she knows that these eggs will be safe when she's piggybacking on the nest because mama gator is going to protect everybody. But the little turtles are born first and they escape and mama gopher turtle gets a free ride by using someone else's nest. Ah, the roseate spoonbill. Hard to believe this bird was almost hunted to extinction back in the early 1900s and late 1800s. People sold their feathers as fans for, for $2 and in Paris, right, they were selling these feathers for as much as $200 a pound to use in ladies' fashions and hats. And you can see by the roseate spoonbill, by the spoonbill, by the mouth, right, the beak, the bill, specialized into hunting in shallow water and the mud. No shrimp or crustacean or small fish is saved from this guy with amazing reflex time. Some people say his reflex time is close to one two hundredth of a second. And that makes him one of the fastest reflex times in the animal kingdom. Here's another picture of the gator hole. Alligators and crocodiles are not the same animal. We're going to talk more about crocodiles in the next unit. We talked about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, the woman who founded the Friends of the Everglades. There's our old homework. And uh, Marjorie lived to be 108 years old. And she wrote the most famous book, The Only Concise History of the Everglades, The Everglades River of Glass, Grass. Boy, I tell you what, that's what got me started in Florida history. What a great read, History of the Everglades. This is a, uh, the emblem of the Army Corps of Engineers. They dug all these channels and dikes and dams to drain South Florida, to get dry land for farming and development, and to make sure that hurricane flooding does not affect us. Yeah, well, the original Everglades, as we talked about, was this big, but now the Everglades has been reduced to like this. It's probably only 45% of its original size before 1947. We've done a lot of dredging, a lot of digging, and that's why this land, except for the Atlanta Coastal Ridge, 
is dry because of those drainage canals that the Army Corps built. Mercury is a big issue. Oh yeah, that's talking about the ridge. And there's the Everglades River grass. And that water used to flow so quickly back in the day that if you dropped your hat on the top of the river, you could watch your hat slowly move away at about 8 to 12 miles an hour. Now there's no current whatsoever. All right. We talked about this is the original flow of the Everglades. I don't think there'll be maybe only one question on the test concerning this. There's the prairies, and these are the hardwood hammocks that sometimes go around old gator holes. There's Flamingo, Southwest Everglades, beautiful if you've never been there. We talked about the mangrove forest and how hard it is to navigate. And in fact, you have to change your charts about every five years because these mangrove inlets sometimes grow and your maps are incorrect because the access ways have been grown over. All right, the 10,000 Island chain, which we talked about before. This is, to the south of this, is good panther territory. Okay, uh, we talked about the pine lands and the ghost orchids and the clamshell orchids. Super rare, very small orchids. And there's always a danger of poachers. Poachers will go into the Everglades and steal these rare orchids and sell a healthy plant on the black market for literally hundreds of dollars. A very rare orchid called the ghost orchid and illustrated here is the clamshell orchid. All right, a little bit more talk about mercury, how the state of Florida is one of the highest in the nation and how it's affecting the eco cycle. It's affecting the Everglades. It's affecting human life. Men, mercury is a deadly poison and it can really cause a lot of damage to human fetuses and bodies through your life because your liver will be in your nervous system and your brain. You know, back in the day when you went to the dentist, you got fillings that were half mercury and half silver. So a lot of people didn't realize that fillings could have a long-term effect from the 1950s, 60s because of its mercury count. And then the big cypress forest, we talked about the fact that some of these trees can live to be 300 years old. And in the 1940s, loggers came in there and cut almost all these forests down, all the old growth forests. And there are mountains and mountains of sawdust from the 1940s when the loggers wanted to get this hardy, waterproof wood to make cracker barrels, waterproof coffins, and waterproof uh, just chest, right? The old crackers love cypress. It's a great wood, and it's a good wood when you're in an environment with lots of water. Okay, take a look at this if you get a chance about the mercury cycle. There'll be about two or three questions on the test about mercury, and uh, that it is, man. There's the Everglades, and they're phosphate mining. They're mining for kale and clay, and you know what? You can't stop industry, but unfortunately, we're getting at the tipping point where the animals are losing most of their habitat and they got to become braver by coming into neighborhoods and search for food. We got to make some hard decisions about the environment and the environment is going to affect the history of Florida for a long time in the future. And we pray that we will not be the first state in the United States to lose a national park. If you get a chance, check out this map. That's the Mercury map. Yeah, unfortunately, we're in the zone, and me being a big fish eater, especially tuna, man, yeah, mercury's even in the oceans. I think swordfish is another high mercury fish, okay? Okay, so 20 questions, 10 multiple choice, 10 true and false, and I'm going to try to divide it up and try to cover all these slides equally, but make sure... Florida Panther, Black Bear, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Gator Holes, Rosette Spoonbills, and this guy are guaranteed, guaranteed to be on the test, okay? So do yourself a favor, sit down, relax, watch the videos again, check it out. Oh yeah, I can't forget the manatee, of course not. And if you study this, right, and you listen to my lectures, and you watch the videos, you will be successful. All right. So, 
Felix Con Color Cory. Uh, it's probably going to be my favorite topic on the test because I have a very warm spot in my heart for the Florida Panther. But you knew that already, didn't you? All right, man. It's Mr. O'Brien saying thank you, and we wish you the best of luck. On